Hello friends, Irene Lyon here and welcome to this entire world of nervous system health and healing. Today I have a rerun, a replay of a lecture I did in September of 2022 that was titled The Undeniable Link Between Early Childhood Stress, we could say Childhood Trauma, Adversity, and chronic illness. Now this is chronic illness that typically occurs later in life, but of course children and teens and, and young adults can also succumb to illness as a result of early, early trauma. Now I won't uh, go into everything that I talk about because I want you to keep on watching and listen to what I have to say, but as an overview, what this really dives into is the research surrounding something called the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. I dive into what this is, I read some passages in some of my favorite books, and I really break down this connection between unhealed early stress, adversity, trauma, and how that plays out later in life. Now, one of the things that seems to be still very unknown is that so many of the things that we might consider to be genetic, um, just what is gonna occur no matter what, because this runs in our family history, we're starting to see that that is not necessarily a true genetic expression, um, and it isn't necessarily something that has to run in the family. But as you'll learn in this talk, we, we, we model or we see our family systems and we shift and change to fit in, to stay safe in these family systems. And this is how we see generations of families that have the same illness, the same sicknesses, for example. And so I dive into why that is not necessarily what has to happen. And um, the other thing that occurs in this video, when I did this talk, it was in um, service and in answering also questions for those interested in working with me through my online courses, specifically Smart Body, Smart Mind. Currently, we're in live session right now as I record this introduction and when you see this video, um, and we will be opening up registration again in the early parts of 2023. In a nutshell, I'll just mention it, Smart Body, Smart Mind does get, it. it, it is designed to get to the root of working with these early adversities, early traumas, often at the pre-verbal level. So before we even understood cognitively what was going on with us. And in many ways, this is one of the missing links in our general therapeutic and mind-body intervention modalities. Even the alternative uh, methodologies often leave out this importance of working with pre-verbal trauma and working with the somatic system in that way. So without further ado, I will uh, get you over to the replay of this lecture and please um, ask questions, comment below this video. My team answers all questions, so do not be shy and enjoy the learning. All right, everyone. Hello, welcome. I am Irene Lyon, and today we're gonna talk about a very important topic. I'm just gonna read the actual title so that I get it 100% right. The title for today, the topic for today is the undeniable link between early childhood stress and chronic illness and, and why healthy aggression and life force energy are essential ingredients for deep healing. So the undeniable link between early childhood stress, we could say childhood adversity, trauma, and chronic illness, we could also add in mental illness, addictions, all the things that we humans tend to suffer from in our current world, Western worlds, and why healthy aggression and life force energy are essential ingredients for deep healing. So before we get into the topic, um, I wanna just make a note that this information can spark up some stuff. Okay, it can, it can bring a little bit of what I like to call, I prefer the word activation. Some people, people might use the word trigger. Trigger tends to have a weird connotation to it. So I like to use the word activation because that's exactly what might occur. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to occur for you. And I've been doing this long enough to know that the theory in its own right and hearing this stuff, maybe for the first time, 
Or maybe you've been hearing this for a lot of times and something today lands a bit differently. We can start to sense old survival patterns popping up as we hear this stuff through our brain and we process it through our body. I tend to teach in a, in a manner that tends to connect that a little bit more. I'm not sure why, but that's just what occurs. Um, so number one, take everybody take a vow to take care of yourselves. If you need to step away from the Zoom, step away from the recording, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do that. I'm really pausing with that one because it's not useful to override and push and push and push through. The recording will be here. You can listen to it afterwards. But what that will show you is that there's without a doubt something bubbling in your system, in your nervous system, in your organ system, in your historical systems that's landing and going, this might be me. Does that make sense? What she's talking about might be exactly why I'm having this trouble or this trouble, this connection, these links are making sense. So if that comes up, that's actually natural. And I would say is a good thing, even though it might be maybe a little uncomfortable just because it might be new. So before we dive into the theory and the talk, and I'm going to read some stuff from some books today, which I love doing. So we'll have a little moment to hear some important passages. Take a second to do what I would call the basics of nervous system health. And for those of you super new to me, this might be completely what is she talking about? So I'm going to walk you through some of them as a way for you to stay connected to the here and now, if you're feeling a little bit of stuff popping up. So these are in no order of importance, but the first one I'm going to get you to connect to is the space that you're sitting on. For most of us, it might be a chair. It might be a kitchen chair, it might be a stool. It might be a, um, a couch a sofa, a Chesterfield, all the words we might use to denote a comfy big couch chair. So just feel, sense that contact of your body with this space under you. And if anything, just how there's this gravity, there's this pressure and that the thing you're on is supporting your body. It's allowing you to stay upright. And of course, your brain and nervous system is keeping you upright, but it's giving you that support. So that would be like number one, connecting with this environment from that tactile felt sense. The next thing might be to notice the world around you. So this idea of connecting with the external world and I know it's tempting when there's a screen to keep your eyes locked on the screen, but if it's okay and if it feels all right to let the eyes, let your focus as I am right now, come away from the screen to see a little out there and to really let the head and the neck and the curiosity and your senses come into that external world. Or it might be that you let it come a little bit towards you. Why that's important, we'll get into through this talk, but if we think about stress and traumas and things that are scary, one of the things that can happen to us is we disconnect, maybe from our body, often from the world around us. So we wanna kind of reestablish I'm here now, here's my seat, here's my home, there's the tree, maybe there's my furry friend, here's my things, could even be as simple as here's my hands. And with that, I might get you to even feel these hands of yours and just connect with them. It's possible that you're someone that has a mind-body practice where you connect and be with your body throughout the day. It could be a yoga practice or a movement practice. Could be a practice of art or journaling, but to just bring your hands together and feel that touch. 
And to feel that touch with a sense of interest, not so much a sense of strain or trying to do anything with them, but just to feel even the temperature. And as you sense these hands of yours, can you continue to sense this ground under you, this connection? Did you lose connection with that ground when you went to focus on the hands? Maybe, maybe not. These are skills of awareness that we have built into us, but they get, we could say, robbed out of our system when we are distracted with the survival stress and the traumas that are in our system. Another thing is to notice our breath, to not change our breath so much, but to notice that it's there. And as you bring some attention to your breath, see what it's doing. And I might guide you just for a moment to actually not change it, but to feel, is it shallow? Is it open and wide? Is it mainly in the belly or is it mainly in the chest? And can you just have kind of a, a look into it and to sense it? There's so much that teaches us in this world that we want to, some people will say, take a deep breath to calm down. When you get to know me really well, you'll know and learn that this is not the best thing when we're feeling a little activated because perhaps the breath is needing to tell us something. But sometimes when we try to force the breath, it actually can backfire and get tighter. And so rather than changing the breath to just notice it. And as you notice that breath, also bringing your focus back to that environment around us, around you. So this has been a very quick dive into some of the basics. Another basic that's more of an idea and a concept is to follow impulse. What that means is if you're feeling a need to squirm a bit in your seat, then let that happen. If you're feeling a need to stand up and yawn, let that happen. If you're feeling a need to have a sip of water, let that happen. If you're having a need to close your eyes and rest your eyes to just come internal, let that happen. If you're feeling a need to let tears out as you hear things today, let that happen and stay connected to the self and the body. If you're feeling a need to go to the toilet, to the bathroom, and you're holding it in because you don't want to miss anything, go and do that and come on back. The recording is happening, right? So all these things are in service of some of these basics I call of nervous system health. And many of these basics, as I mentioned, we don't have immediate access to when our system is filled with what we would call survival stress. So if you can use these as we go through this talk, and I might remind you of some of them as we go through and take them with you, practice them. These form really the basis of, of I would say the ABCs when I'm teaching my students in my courses. Um, and I will talk a little bit about um, the courses that I run and one right now is under registration until Monday, it's called Smart Body, Smart Mind. So I will do questions around that after the fact. Um, so I'm curious to know just from this little, little snapshot of connecting to self, connecting to the ground, what are you noticing? So I'd love to see in the chat, just, just so that we can feel into the field where people are at, what you might've noticed, what might've been interesting, Someone said shallow breath, that's possible. Yes, it's very common that shallow breath is happening for many of us. It's a challenge to stay connected, yeah. Again, if this is the first time um, in your history that you've maybe been asked to notice these very specific things in this context, it might seem a bit hard to do and that's just practice. Someone said calming down agitation in the body. So a little something, something. The desire to sway in my seat. Wonderful. Movement is something that we naturally do as humans to keep ourselves maybe present, 
or maybe calm. If you've ever talked to someone or maybe you do this and you notice they'll start rubbing their legs or squeezing their hands, that is not just jitters. That is, that is the body's autonomic process to try to stay connected in the here and now. We do these things quite naturally without realizing. My pelvis tilts back. There's a wave of energy in it. Breath is shallow, excessive thirst, itching, hard to stay connected. I get frustrated at myself, but trying to breathe into it. So I'm going to suggest if you feel a frustration, notice that frustration, and then just come back to how you sense that ground under you. Calmer, someone said, fidgeting. Someone had a widening in their chest, a relaxation, some yawns. Yeah, some of you might have felt that there's a bit of a, a parasympathetic ease come in with a yawn. Someone said their heart was racing a little bit. So these are all little things to notice. This noticing of our physiology is a really big part of restoring health back to our nervous system. All right. <clears throat> yeah, someone said difficult to not control the breath when I notice it. Yeah, and we've been taught, so many of us have been taught to change our breath, to make it bigger, make it deeper. Um, and we want to see how we can notice it because our breathing, our autonomic physiology, it will do what it wants to do when we give it the space to do so. All right, so thank you as for all of you to, who played with that and, and really brought that into your attention and awareness. I do have notes so that I stay on track today. Um, so first off, like I said, right now, we're in a big registration for my program that's 12 weeks called Smart Body, Smart Mind. I'm just gonna name it because I might mention it during this talk as we talk about healthy aggression and building capacity. And in essence, what Smart Body, Smart Mind is doing, this is a program we've been running for about seven years now. This is the 12th time this September that we will be doing it live with participants and alumni. Um, it's all about teaching you, the person, how to become your own medicine, how to gain more regulation back into your system, how to gain more capacity, somatic capacity, nervous system capacity, how to track and sense sensations in the body, which are pivotal to healing any kind of stored trauma and stress. We're teaching you how to reconnect with the environment, we're also teaching you high level education um, and I'll get into some of that today. So all these things play a part in this, in this really unique course. Um, it is on the foundations of three main methodologies. I'm just gonna name them for those of you who may know them. One is the work of somatic experiencing, which is Peter Levine's work. One is the work of Kathy Kane, who is also a colleague of Peter's and mine, we're all colleagues. Um, her work is somatic practice. Kathy Kane really put on the map this need to work with the neurobiology through the stress organs, through organs like the adrenals, the gut, the brainstem, the fascia, the bone, believe it or not, the eyes, the movements, the spaces in the body, because this body of ours gets hit when we store stress and we store trauma and these things called survival energies, fight, flight, and freeze. And then the thing that I feel really blends it and bridges it all together is the Feldenkrais work that I have studied and I'm trained in the Feldenkrais method. This is the work of Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. He's long past, but he was really the first person from what we know who was working with neuroplasticity before neuroplasticity was even a hot topic. And by long ago, I mean Second World War kind of time and post-World War II working with people with severe injuries and helping them restore their health through movement and through awareness and through patterns of the sensory motor nervous system. So these things I've just mentioned are my expertise and I bring them all together in Smart Body, Smart Mind. So all of this too, is in, is, in, is in service of helping your system find safety. And by safety, I mean cellular safety, the kind of safety that we want to teach our newborn infant when they come out, if we have the pleasure of 
having a child. They need safety. They need connection. They need to know that they belong. They need to know that their feelings and their needs are important. They need to be attuned to. So the reason I mention kiddos, and I talk about kids a lot and babies a lot, is on purpose. And it's because us as adults, if you are struggling and feel free, I'd like to know who here knows that they're wanting to heal a certain ailment, condition, trouble. Um, maybe you have had a diagnosis of something. Um, we have found, and again, this is what I'm gonna read from in a little bit, these links between early childhood stress and chronic illness, that when we have not had the safety, connection, attunement, and this capacity to be our exuberant little human selves, later <clears throat> in life, it causes problems and troubles. So I'm gonna follow my impulse and have a little drink here. <clears throat> so someone said here, I just got diagnosed with osteoarthritis last month. Another, I wanna heal digestive issues. Another autoimmune, you said you see my senses, you mean ulcerative colitis, which is the gut. MS, so multiple sclerosis, another MS, chronic illness and pain, eczema and allergies, rheumatoid arthritis, so another autoimmune, chronic headaches, restless leg. Um, Bonnie, can you put a note that I could address restless leg so I don't forget? <laughs> I might forget that one just because it's not um, typically within this topic, but it's still within the topic. Migraine headaches started in childhood, colitis, fibromyalgia, hyperthyroidism, tinnitus, some of us might say tinnitus, ringing in the ear, also connected to dysregulation of the nervous system. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, chronic uh, fatigue, depression, poor sleep, nightmares. So there's a theme here, right? There's a lot of what we would call autoimmune, chronic illness, um, but then elements of night terrors, restless legs, um, those sort of fall into their own category that I will definitely address. So thank you all for sharing why you're here and what you're interested in working with and healing. So the reason I bring this up, there was some research. So I'm gonna go into kind of more lecture mode now. Who here has heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACE study? If you've been with me for a bit, you've heard me talk about this over and over and over again, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, give you the history in a very quick nutshell. So back in the 80s in California was La Jolla, there was a big initiative through one of the health insurance companies, it was the Kaiser Permanente, they realized that um, obesity was creating a lot of comorbidities, a lot of health problems. And, and there is just this need to help people heal and find ways to lose weight in a way that was healthy. And the main researcher, his name was Vincent Felitti, and he didn't want to do it in a medical model. He wanted it to be holistic, which for his time, I think was pretty cool. He wanted to provide uh, counseling and advice and exercise and all the things that we know is important. And what he found, and I'm really speeding this story up, people were having success. There were individuals who were dropping, you know, hundreds of pounds with this multimodal, multidimensional um, I don't like to say treatment, but intervention where they had opportunity to work with their bodies and work with professionals. But what he found was that those were who were losing the most weight and were having the most success were the ones who were dropping off. They were dropping out of the program. Now, someone might say, well, maybe that was because they were having success. So they didn't want to continue, but they literally just disappeared. And they started to see this trend happen. And so as a good scientist and researcher would, he got curious with that. And they were able to follow up with these people and track them down and ask them, you know, why did you stop? What, what's going on? You know, that kind of inquisitiveness, surveying them. And many of them had said that their excess weight can you think what this might've been? It was a protective barrier. 
it was keeping them safe. Many of them had been sexually abused. And so having this excess weight kept them feeling hidden from the world so that they wouldn't get attacked again. And so he found this to be very interesting because again, this was like, I think it was late eighties. This was new stuff. So he presented this finding at a conference, I believe in Florida shortly after. And a gentleman um, by the name of Robert Anda, he was working with the CDC at the time, heard this research and he said, this is very interesting. I think we should follow up and design a study to see what else is going on in these people's systems. And at the time, I think they had something crazy like 86,000 people in their database. They had a lot of people within this insurance company. And so they designed a study to question people, a survey. They designed an adverse childhood experiences survey to ask these folks what their histories were like. Have you experienced domestic violence? Did a parent have a mental illness? Was a parent addicted to something? Was a parent incarcerated? Were you ever hit, abused, screamed at? There was a list. And of course they put this out to their people, their, their um, membership within this insurance program. And when they got the results back, they were absolutely stunned because it, a very large chunk of them, I think if I correctly believe it was th three quarters of the people had had at least one adverse experience where there was one of these things, depression in the household, abuse, incarceration, um, addiction, et cetera. The ACE study is very easily found online. You can see the list of 10 questions and they went, wow, there are a lot of adults here who were in very, very chronically unsafe homes growing up. And then they compared that with illness, the illnesses that they had. And statistics is not my forte. These guys are good with statistics. They started to study the connections and the correlations. And what they found was that the more ACEs, so the more adverse childhood experiences you had, it connected with that much more chronic illness, that much more troubles with your body, with the heart, with the immune system. Osteoarthritis, someone mentioned, was a huge one within these people. Addiction, cancers, MS, Alzheimer's, depression. It was a very, very long list. And so I'm gonna read something here. I have to hold a little far away from my eyes, forgot my glasses again today. Um, so this is from the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And this is a book written by Bessel van der Kolk. It is a heavy duty book. Um, I actually don't recommend this book when you're new on this journey, because I found that people can get quite activated learning and reading from this. It really is more so meant for um, mental health professionals, doctors, et cetera. Um, so just, I'm gonna put that little disclaimer there. But this is um, him talking about this ACE study and the findings. And it's in chapter nine, page 148. And the subtitle is Child Abuse, Our Nation's Largest Health Problem. So this is Bessel talking about Robert Anda, who was the CDC researcher who said to Felitti, who was doing these studies in California, we need to study this. And so this is him responding to seeing the results. The first time I heard Robert, Robert Anda present the results of the ACE study, he could not hold back the tears. In his career at the CDC, he had previously worked in several major risk areas, including tobacco research and cardiovascular health. But when the ACE study data started to appear on his computer screen, he realized that they had stumbled upon the gravest and most costly public health issue in the United States, child abuse. I've got shivers right now. He had calculated that its overall cost exceeded those of cancer and heart disease and that eradicating child abuse in America would reduce the overall rate of depression by more than half, 
alcoholism by two thirds and suicide, IV drug use, domestic violence by three quarters. It would also have a dramatic effect on workplace for performance and vastly decrease the need for incarceration. When the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health was published in 1964, it unleashed a decade, decades long legal and medical campaign that has changed daily life and long-term health prospects for millions. And we know this, some of us were around when those non-smoking campaigns came out and they actually worked. I remember um, when I was in school, a lot of parents stopped smoking because the kids brought pamphlets home to the parents and said, you have to stop this. And it worked. A little side, side view there, side note. The number of American smokers fell from 42% of adults in 1965 to 19% in 2010. And it's estimated that nearly 800,000 deaths from lung cancer were prevented between 1975 and 2000 from this initiative. Last paragraph of this chapter. The ACE study, however, has had no such effect. I add the deep sigh. Follow-up studies and papers are still appearing around the world, but the day-to-day -day reality of children, and he mentions a case study he had just read in this chapter, and the children in outpatient clinics and residential treatment centers around the country remains virtually the same. Only now they receive high doses of psychotropic agents, which makes them more tractable, more attractable, but also impairs their ability to feel pleasure and curiosity, to grow and develop emotionally and intellectually, and to become contributing members of society. That's a heavy few paragraphs there. I would, you know, it's, that shows a lot. And what I've seen, let me just get my other book here. So actually, before I go forward, everyone who's here, just take a moment to let that not just sink in, because I think it's set, sunk in for many of us, but to come back to that ground, to come back to that connection with the environment. What that really shows is that if we could really tackle this nervous system piece, because the connection here, the mistreatment of children occurs, the mistreatment of children occurs when the parent doesn't have connection to self and they're not attuned to themselves and they don't understand how precious and important those first few years of life are, but they are stuck typically in this survival stress. They have their own traumas from their own childhood that were never addressed, that were never acknowledged. So we're in a very interesting time right now. And this book is a, a few years old, um, it is becoming, I think, more mainstream that this research is finally coming out. But the reason, and Gabor Mate has talked about this, that he believes it has been tricky to get this out, is it would mean that the physicians, the psychiatrists, the healthcare providers, all the people that work with people, the school teachers, they would have to acknowledge their own trauma. This is what's interesting about this is it's in all of us. We have all had something that has occurred to us that hasn't been nice. And even Vincent Felitti, when he talks about coming across this research and he starts remembering his own childhood and wow, this is why this happened. And this is why this happened. There's a beautiful 18 minute video. Um, don't go there yet. Cause I want you to stay here with me but it's called A Tribute to Vincent Felitti. We'll pop it in the YouTube show more after this so that you can find it. It's A Tribute to Vincent Felitti. It's a video of him talking about his findings. And he said it's tough because it means that everybody has to wake up to this, not just the person seeking out the healing and the work. So I wanted to read that because it was a very important um, part of that book showing the, the significance of this stored traumatic stress that causes the abuse and then the cycle continues. Someone said, how did we become so unaware? So many things, right? We've, we've created industry, we've westernized and medicalized the birth process. Big pharma is a big portion of it, but really we've been 
in this world of disconnecting with our bodies um, from the start of the domestication of plants and animals 10,000 years ago. And it really just started to speed up in the last couple thousands of years with the industrial revolution and all those sorts of pieces. So it's a very big piece. Gabor, even right now, some of you know of Gabor Mate, I think. Um, he's a pretty prominent physician and author. He lives here in the same hometown of Vancouver that I do. Um, I've had the pleasure of being in lectures with him. And his new book, I think, is going to help push this, this understanding forward. It's called The Myth of Normal. Um, and a lot of what he talks about, my sense in that book, are these topics of how we've normalized telling little ones to be quiet and to not feel their sensations. And this bleeds out into their lives. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit to just teach a little bit of um, nervous system physiology for those of you that are new here. And I'm going to do a crash course. It's going to be quick, but in a nutshell, our nervous systems, our autonomic nervous system, it is governing everything in our body. We have a central nervous system that's our brain and our spinal cord. Then we have this peripheral nervous system that comes out of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system has a few things to it. One branch is called sensory motor. This is my handy example. I always show you when I teach this, I have these cups of liquid. I can feel the weight and I know how much muscle I have to bring in. And you can even play this now with me for an experiment if you have something near the you that you can pick up. I can feel that this isn't scalding hot anymore, so I can feel it. I'm sensing, and there's a sensory motor reaction, interaction, and this is part of my peripheral nervous system. The movement of our body is really important when healing the nervous system, so I wanna make note of that. So sensory motor is part of our peripheral. The other part of our peripheral nervous system is our autonomic nervous system. That has two functions, three if we really break it down. One is our entire internal processes, digestion, immune system, temperature regulation, heart rate, blood pressure, um, all the things. If we shiver, that's because of our autonomic nervous system. If we sweat because we're too hot, autonomic nervous system. This autonomic nervous system is also responsible for our survival responses, fight, flight, and freeze. Fight, flight, and freeze. Fight is, as it sounds, protection, fighting off something that isn't good for us. Flight, I can't fight. I got to flee, get out of here, get the heck out of Dodge, as we might say. Freeze. If we can't fight and we can't flee, the default then in the autonomic nervous system is to shut down. We need these, right? We need these. I want you to have these responses if danger comes your way. But what happens in the human system, and I think this is just a result of our very intellectual brain that can override things, this human brain of ours and society and culture and conditioning it traps the fight, flight, freeze in us. We don't let it out. We don't express it. And a big part of that connects to how we were taught when we were little, this early childhood adversity. So if we did not have an environment that was nurturing and connective and safe and allowed us to express, and when we hurt and had an owie, we were allowed to say so and cry, or when we were frustrated, our parents allowed us to show that frustration as opposed to punishing us for being frustrated about something that we can't figure out. All these things that we tend to do in our society slowly over time builds a little person to have, I'm going to use my most full cup here, tons of survival stress inside. Fight, flight, and then a big clamp like a pressure cooker right, of freeze. This soup, if you will, this, this filled up system, when we have fight flight on board at the same time with freeze, this is what creates all those things that you guys mentioned in the chat, the chronic illness, the pain, the cycling between, if we think of digestion, 
diarrhea and constipation. The migraine headaches, which is a strong dilation of the blood vessels coupled with stops of flow. The burning in the fingers, if someone has say Raynaud's, the lack of circulation to the body so that we have energy in our muscles to move. The lack of good chemicals going to our brain so that we can connect with people and think and create. The other thing with the autonomic nervous system is it also governs our ability to socially engage. If I smile, if I frown, you might see my face and you're like, what is Irene doing, right? If I make funny faces, you'll pick up on that, I hope. <laughs> and maybe you, you laugh, maybe you don't. Maybe I um, say, hey, look over there. There might be an instant, right? This ability to orient and to connect with what another person is saying and doing is also part of our social, sorry, our autonomic nervous system that is our social engagement system. This is where that vagus nerve comes in. A lot of us have heard of the vagus nerve. It's getting very popular. It's a portion of our parasympathetic nervous system. It governs our digestion, our rest digest, but it also is responsible for freeze. So the vagus nerve also has a branch that puts us into freeze. So it has a branch that rest digests and repairs, a branch that freezes, and then a branch that socially engages. It's quite complex. I did a lecture yesterday on biohacking and why biohacking the nervous system for health and healing ain't the best bet to do because it's more than just stimulating a nerve. It's how the whole system relates to that nerve in relation to the environment, to yourself, people, history, etc. So this idea of fight, flight, freeze, staying both on at the same time, for me, when I was learning this work back in 2008, that was like the light bulb that went off. I saw the lecture that I was being taught. We were explained when there's this cycling of high, high sympathetic and high, high parasympathetic shutdown. This is when the system breaks down. This is what creates these troubles. So I'm gonna read another page from this book called Scared Sick. And this is not as well known, but I actually would say this is the better book to read than The Bodies Keeps the Store. Sorry, Bessel. But it's a little more paddle, pal palatable. Um, it's a much more paced, um, Scared Sick, The Role of Childhood, Childhood Trauma in Adult Disease. It's by Robin Carr Morse. Very easy to find that. Let me just see the page here. So this is her actually quoting someone else. She's quoting a, a gentleman, another medical doctor by the name of Robert Scare. He is we less well known, which is unfortunate because his book Trauma Spectrum is one of my favorite books on these topics. So she's paraphrasing something that he has said regarding these chronic illnesses. So I'm going to read this and then we'll get into a few more pieces about these connections and then we'll get into healthy aggression. So again, this is a talking of what Robert Scare found in his practices working with folks with these chronic conditions that many of you are living with and want to heal. So Scare is, uses, Scare uses a neurobiological concept of kindling. Now this is a fancy word in our somatic world, but what is kindling for those of you that make fires? It's small pieces of wood and it gets the ignition going fast, right? You need kindling to start something. So it's like fast burning fuel. So SCARE uses a neurological concept of kindling to explain how homeostasis is derailed by strong exposures to trauma. In common usage, kindling is the wood that easily ignites larger pieces of wood. In SCARE's paradigm, kindling is a process in the brain, and I'm also gonna add the nervous system, whereby pathways that have been sensitized by stress can spontaneously ignite without further stimulation. This is where we might have a chronic pain response that kind of kindles. It, it starts with the tiniest little thing. Those of you who've ever had migraine headaches, you know how those start typically, yeah? What happens? Let me know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you guys into this passage a bit. 
There might be a feeling of pain that's subtle. There might be an aura. There might be this feeling of something feels tense. And then before you know it, there's a snowball and your head is super sore with intensity. If we really start to feel our sensations and our pain cycles, they can be tracked back to something that we didn't pay attention to earlier, earlier, earlier that day, or earlier, earlier, earlier that week, we ignored a stress sign. And then the kindling, the body says, no mas, you know, we're, we're going to keep this going so that you pay attention, right? This is also why Gabor's uh, Mate's book, When the Body Says No, is such an appropriate title. The body is saying, no, you're not listening to me. So I'm going to give you a problem so that you have to listen to me. That was a little side sidebar there. So sensitized neurons take on lives of their own, spontaneously stimulating neighboring neurons with no outside event triggering the activity. So that's one passage I wanted to read. Because some of you might be wondering, how does chronic pain work? How come one day I'm like this and then the next day I'm debilitated? So I'm gonna make you guys connect these in your own brains. It's that fight, flight, and freeze. So there might be a system in your body where you're actually in a bit of a shutdown. You're not feeling the pain. And the system is still filled with stress, but it's on this side of shutdown. And then something triggers the body and then the activation happens. The fight flight happens. It stimulates the nervous system to basically go into more of a threat mode. And then the system cycles back and forth between these fight, flight, and freeze responses, which is then what triggers these symptoms, these syndromal responses, like a, like a migraine headache, like IBS, et cetera. So I'm going to read another little passage here. Scare defines diseases of trauma as those that uniquely reflect the seesaw cycling of both divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So just as we were saying, both the adrenaline driven sympathetic division that stimulates the heart and raises the blood pressure and the cortisol driven parasympathetic division that returns the body to rest and digest are also are involved in the strangely cycling, cycling symptoms of trauma. The unregulated or dysregulated oscillation of the process is the hallmark of trauma related disease. Now, the one thing that he didn't have in this book because we didn't understand it back then is what Stephen Porges put on the map, who was the founder of the polyvagal theory. I think some of you have heard of the polyvagal theory. We now know that the parasympathetic, as I mentioned a second ago, is not just rest, digest, it's also shut down. So these, it's more the cycling between shut down and adrenalized sympathetic fight flight. Okay. So again, more from scare. The symptoms of trauma are bimodal. You have flashbacks, panic, anxiety attacks, terror, and you have dissociation. Does this ring a bell for anyone? Which is the numbing out and avoidance, retreat and depression. That's been the conundrum of the whole diagnosis of PTSD. You have symptoms that are both arousal-based and fear-based. Any therapist will tell you that if you kick off a traumatic memory, the person becomes panicky, goes into suddenly dissociative state. As I look at the so-called psychosomatic syndromes of my patients that nobody understands, they all have parasympathetic shutdown and sympathetic fight flight dominant states, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, um, GERDs, which is reflux, all characterized by a cycling of autonomic dysregulation. A little bit more. Scare has particularly particular sympathy, sympathy for sufferers of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. A neurologist with 30 years of experience, this is SCARE, in trauma and re rehabilitative medicine. SCARE says that these patients with, have been poorly understood, poorly treated, and often dismissed as hypochondriacs. It is common, he says, for practitioners of Western med medicine, with the exception of rheumatologists who specialize in these syndromes to view these patients as suffering psychosomatic illness. And he has that in brackets or quotes. The symptoms hard to measure objectively, objectively and hard to re re remediate 
include diffuse skeletal pain, points of tenderness across the body, morning stiffness, daytime fatigue, and interrupted sleep. Those that have fibromyalgia experience many fluctuating symptoms of autonomic dysregulation, including numbness, tingling, hypervigilance, emotional instability, dizziness, and cognitive impairment. Scare believes the fibromyalgia reflects pre-verbal trauma. This is that early trauma piece that is difficult to document. The muscle pain he notes is probably the result of tightening muscles during REM sleep in which the patient is reenacting the traumatic event. Scare believes the irritability, fatigue, and emotional and cognitive impairment of experienced experience by fibromyalgia sufferers are due to the subsequent loss of restorative sleep from the interruption of the REM cycle. That was a big portion. I know that was a lot, but that, that paragraph, that page sums up what is occurring when the fight, flight, and freeze are on at the same time. As he mentioned, the disruption in sleep. So when we are living, so this is a very important other piece to remember or to learn, when we are living in fight, flight, freeze, the true rest digest of the parasympathetic, what do you think is happening to it? Because it's still wired in us, but it's just not happening. The gear isn't coming on board. I think of the parasympathetic like a gearbox in a standard car. You've got the engine, but you have these different gears. So when we're stuck in fight, flight, fright, fight, flight, freeze, it's like we're in one gear all the time. If you've ever tried to drive a standard car with only one gear, it doesn't work so well, right? You need the variation of the gears to make the engine work and slow down and speed up. So we need as humans, as mammals, we need to live for the most part in this rest digest. It's called the dorsal branch of the parasympathetic. It's called the low tone dorsal. It's a gear that allows our cells to repair. It allows the gut lining to repair, which happens every night when we sleep, we want it to. It allows the immune system to rev up and to fight the things that we need to fight, cancer cells that shouldn't be there. All these things get cleaned up when we're in rest digest, typically when we sleep. We also want to be living as human mammals. What do you think? In connection. We want to have the social engagement on board, not just for connection and to be seen and heard and be with people, but it directly relates to our heart. So part of our parasympathetic nervous system that allows us to engage with the world. Remember I got you to do that orienting piece to look and to see and have your eyes be with the world around us. That helps stimulate our social engagement nervous system. That connects to our heart directly through the vagus nerve. So when we are better able to socially engage, we're better able to regulate and self-regulate our heart rate response. Babies don't have this social engagement, self-regulation on board when they're young. So as he said, he feels, he used the term, he really focused on fibromyalgia, but this is macro across these autoimmune and chronic illness conditions as well as severe anxiety and depression, usually from what we're seeing again, reminding you of that ACE study, what's happened is those formative years, those formative first few years, it's really the first three years that are most important. That's when that part of the vagus nerve that goes to the face and goes to the heart and goes to this ability to hear and be in the world, that's when it's really being built being myelinated. The nerves are not myelinated when we're born and we need that engagement, that attunement. Remember I said safety, connection to myelinate those nerves. Therefore, what occurs in these situations with lots of early stress, adversity, and I'll also add, because sometimes um, it's not that the study gets knocked because it's still a very solid study 
it gets a little poo-pooed because there's no um, traumas related to say surgical trauma or birth trauma, which are real things. But we know that they have a very similar representation. Little person is scared, stuff is happening that is unknown to them. And so their system goes into fight flight. And if they can't fight and they can't flee, which usually when you're that little, you cannot, you default to freeze. And so that is why these early adversities pop out these severe conditions that are known to have this representation of fight, flight, and freeze happening at the same time. So I caught a question in the chat and I'll go to the question soon. Someone said, then why am I not rested? Why am I not repairing if I sleep all the time? We can sleep, but we can sleep in a, in a shutdown state. So if we go to sleep and we aren't yet working with and taking these stressors out of our system, we can pass out. We can sleep so hard that we don't even hear an alarm go off, but our body isn't in, I'm going to use that gearbox example. It's not in the rest digest gear. It's in the high shutdown gear. So this is where and I'm sure Scare would say he would have, and I'm sure Gabor and my colleagues would say, I have clients that they, they sleep all day. They can't get enough rest and they're still unwell. Their immune system is still struggling. And it's because the immune system isn't getting that, that healthy rest digest gear, which is also responsible via that parasympathetic. So that is an answer to that question. Um, so I'm just going to look at my notes and then I'm going to head into the questions here. And I'll encourage everyone to reconnect. Have you lost connection with that ground under you? Have you found yourself either really engaged or a little disengaged, maybe a little pissed off? This can bring up a little bit of aggravation, um, these sorts of things. Someone asked, what are th some things to consider to heal and recover? I will get into that. I will definitely get into that. I'm going to read another quote. This is something that I found through one of Gabor's books, and it's going to go very beautifully with me speaking about how we heal this stuff. Um, and this is him actually quoting another person by the name of Hans Seeley, who's long past. He was like the, the person who really put the autonomic nervous system and homeostasis on the map back in the day. So what he said is that awareness, so inevitably a big part of what we do when we teach you and when one starts to relearn how to regulate their nervous system, there needs to be awareness built in the body. And so Seely says, awareness also means learning what the signs of stress are in our own bodies, how our bodies telegraph us when our minds have missed the cues. This is really important. I'm going to say it again, how our bodies telegraph us, how they give us information when our mind, when our cognition have missed the cues in both human and animal studies, it has been observed that the physiological stress response is a more accurate gauge of the organism's real experience rather than the conscious awareness or observed behavior. So this is the paradox of the human condition. We might not think that we're stressed. We might think that we're fine, that there's nothing going on, but inside our body, it's screaming at us and we're not connected to it. And that is by our upbringing, typically. Again, if we were the kiddo that had parents, and it doesn't have to be abuse, by the way, this is actually in some ways, I think more common is we're expressing ourselves and we're being told to behave. You have to sit still. You can't dance in the morning. That's for dance practice. You can't create that, 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 that doesn't look like anything. You're not coloring in the lines. I'm going to be like little things that we say to kids that really, that really harm them, right? their emotions, their sadness, their anger. So the internal body is what we need to learn how to listen to. 
And part of relearning how to listen to our internal body is starting to understand, first of all, A, we have a body that we want to listen to. And remember how I said at the very beginning, this idea of following your impulses, following what your body needs. If you do anything after today, whether you continue with me or not, see how you can continue to follow your impulses. Can you really start to listen to when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, when you're tired, when you need a break from something, when you feel an urge to do something that just doesn't make a lot of sense, but something's telling you, I think I need to try this today, or I need to walk this path differently today. Listening to that, we would call it gut instinct. That is coming from our body. And it can take for some of us some time to recultivate that. So awareness is a very big piece that we want to um, cultivate and build. So I mentioned restless leg. So I'm just going to address that because this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Restless leg. Um, so sometimes it might be a deficiency in minerals, but I know from doing this enough times that people will say I've my minerals are good. I've supplemented with magnesium because that's what I was told to do. And I'm still having that agitation in my legs. Remember fight flight. So imagine you're a little kid. I'm going to put a little example and you are, um, you do not like your home life. <laughs> your parents are crazy. Your, your siblings are crazy. You're being forced to eat your dinner and you don't want to, you, you're, you're, you know that you are not being treated well, but as a little person, you cannot cognitively understand what's going on in your body. And so the desire is to what? Maybe to fight and some kids will be violent with their parents and it's usually because they're not being attuned to, but they might try to flee, but they can't, right? You can't usually as a five-year-old, six-year-old, 10-year-old even run away. Some might try, but it doesn't work very well. You're dependent on that family system. So you are storing fight and flight because you're not fleeing. And so the system goes into freeze. What's interesting, you grow up, you're an adult. And a thing that can often occur is some of you, many of you, you might be in a very safe environment. You might have a, a lovely spouse, a partner. You actually have, you know, food in the fridge, shelter, things are actually good. A common thing occurs when we get all of our ducks in a row and we have all these basic needs met is our system doesn't have to be in shutdown as much anymore. Things are a little safe. But then someone's like, oh, I'm having anxiety all of a sudden. When I go to bed, my legs are wanting, like there's just this restlessness in them. I don't understand it. And I'm putting this example in to give you a bigger picture that that is your system coming out of fight flight. Or with restless leg, the system is feeling that, that desire to run. Now, in those moments when restless leg is coming up, that's where you want to tune in and feel and actually let the legs be restless. That's why I said, if you need to fidget in your chair, please, please do that because there's something in the system needing to be released. So restless leg is typically in our work, in the somatic work, a sign of fight flight that needs to exit the building, exit your body. And typically you want to move that through movement. Now, sometimes a person might not even be able to tune into those running responses. And again, that's this part of building our awareness. Can you start to be like, oh, wow, that's that energy in the legs that Irene was talking about, rather than lay there in bed and try to breathe it out, stand up, stand up and see if the body wants to move to get that energy out. Okay, I'm going to go into some of the questions here. And I'm going to talk about anger very, very shortly. So someone said here, is the program, so is your program, Smart Body, Smart Mind, manageable for people who work and have a dysregulated nervous system? 100%. This is exactly what this program is built for. So I understand some of you are brand new to me. I was in private practice for a long time, working with people with everything that was mentioned above, all the various syndromes and anxieties and, and such dysregulation. It was very clear that while one-on-one -on -one work was good with me in that moment, a person needed a lot more learning. They needed to learn the theory way more in depth than what we're getting right now. A person needed homework. 
they needed to come back to the things that they never got when they were little with their primary caregiver. So while in this program, I don't call it reparenting or inner child work, I really call it growing capacity to be with the body in the way that your system probably wanted to have it when you were little, that attunement. The following the impulse concept is me teaching you and saying, I need you to attune to your body and give it what it needs because it's possible it doesn't know how to not only reach out and get it, but know that it even needs food, know that it even needs hydration, that it needs sun, air, all these things. So 100% um, completely for all of you that are working with and living with dysregulation. Now I will say for each person, you're all unique. You're all in your own individual capacity. So some of you might, and this is just from hearing my students, you might move through the course at a fairly good pace. And for some, you might spend the first month just working on the first week's work. And that's 100% cool and good because you need to grow your capacity in your own pace. Now, I mentioned a second ago, the, um, what was it? This ability to express, right? To fight, to flee. One of the hallmarks, and if I could say like, this is sort of, I don't like to say there's a goal, but one of the goals in growing more capacity and in growing more regulation is to be comfortable and to welcome our anger responses, our healthy aggression. Now, it's not something that we do on day one. I don't say in the first week, okay, we're all going to growl and pretend we're animals and get a baseball bat out and hit things. It's not like that. We wait until we get into about week seven-ish to start to work with healthy aggression impulses through sound, through movement, and through intention. And the reason why we wait is because the anger energy and the healthy aggression energy, the life force energy, it has a lot of energy. It's big, right? Think about the lion roaring and the animal protecting its young, the mother protecting its young. There's a lot of a, a, an energy and it's never this thought, right? An animal in the wild isn't going to sit there and go, there's a wolf trying to get my baby cubs. Should I lash out? Maybe I should, I don't know, maybe. They don't do that, right? Immediate anger, immediate fight. And so for us humans, because we're human, we have the human brain, but we also have the mammalian physiology. But for most of us, we were not taught from a young age how to cultivate and express this life force energy. If anything, it was squashed. It was depressed. Depression is connected to this squashing of life force energy and healthy aggression. It's super important to understand. And again, we're starting to see that the thoughts of what causes depression are really being um, debunked. It's not a chemical imbalance. It is what's happening in the physiology and how we've suppressed these emotions. So we want to build up capacity in the body to feel the little things, the little stressors, the little sensations, the little niggles, so that we're building up more and more of the language of our body sensation, so that when the system is ready to release the big stored angers and the hurts and the griefs and the harms, it's like, I got this. I have the capacity and I don't have to think, is this okay? You know in your system, this is okay and I need to get this out. So healthy aggression is a very, very big part of restoring health to many of the chronic conditions that you guys named, the chronic conditions named in these books, really in many ways, the human condition of what we would call mental illness, chronic illness, addiction, et cetera. So that is a little bit about healthy aggression that I wanted to share. Um, I'm gonna go into the questions here. Someone asked, was it really osteoarthritis that was linked to the ACEs? Yes, it was. Um, and it was also rheumatoid arthritis, both. 
how do we inform parents about these teachings without them hearing or interpreting this as them being bad parents? That's a great question. Well, in the learnings I've done with my teachers who specifically and exclusively work with parents, bad isn't the best word, but there is an element that a parent must take on, which is I did something wrong. I made a mistake. There has to be an owning up to, and again, my, my teacher, Stephen Terrell, who co-teached with Kathy and they wrote the book, Nurturing Resilience Together. He has said, yep, you screwed up. You made a mistake and now let's move on. And you have to heal and grieve what is occurred. You have to heal and grieve that you let your babies cry themselves to sleep, that you smacked them, that you forced them to do a sport that they didn't want to do, that you gave them love when they had good grades, but when they didn't, you punished them and disengaged from them. You have to come to terms with the, that was wrong. And I think what has occurred in a lot of the, I'm not sure where it's come from, but this notion of we have to um, keep everything PC and everyone has to feel good. Sometimes we have to say to even our kids, that's wrong. You're not supposed to do that, right? This is healthy shame. We're gonna, I'm gonna be talking with my husband with another lecture like this on Saturday on parenting and the importance of healthy shame, which for those of you who had toxic, horrific, terrible, abusive shame, might seem you might be getting really like that's impossible there's no such thing as healthy shame yes there is this is another thing that we get into in smart body smart mind is learning the differences between the two and how to start working with the toxic shame that is stored within the physiology um so we inform parents by informing them about their nervous systems first it always has to be the parent that understands how this works and their system first. I have never seen a situation where someone has brought a kid to me and the parent isn't interested and it works out. I wish it were true, but the parents have to understand this for themselves first, because believe it or not, when the parent or the caregiver or whomever gets this on board and they start to see this little being as a little being with a nervous system, but also human expression, it gets pretty easy to be with them. I'm thinking of a, a story. I was going to mention this story. And now this is the perfect time to. Um, I did do a video on this a while ago, but my husband and I were in Rome quite a few years ago. We were traveling through the, the ancient cities, the, the Colosseum, Palatine Hill. It was a long day and it was hot. And we were with a very a specific tour company and there was maybe 30 people in the group and there was a family with a top uh he was about five years old his name was levi i still remember it because they kept shouting his name because he was misbehaving poor little levi did not want to be touring the roman Colosseum that day but he was with his grandparents and his parents and there was a point where we were waiting to go where he screamed and ran away, grandpa picked him up and smacked him. And I'm just sitting here watching this going, God, this is gonna be a fun tour. And what did Levi do? He smacked grandpa back. And then what did grandpa do? He smacked him back again. And then the crying started and then he was put in the corner and he was just not happy. And this went on for the whole day until we got to the last tour, which was the Colosseum. If you've ever been there, there's this holding pen at the bottom where they make you wait. And there's all these little rocks um, that you're waiting on, these stones. And I'm just going, oh boy, this is gonna be a fun one. And he started picking up the rocks. And what do you think he started doing with the rocks? Fight, hitting, throwing them to his parents. And I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to do something. And I scrouched down and I started playing with the rocks. And he saw me and he was like, what's this? What's this adult doing sitting on the rocks? And he saw me and I said, and I picked one up and I was like, you want to play? So he came over and he spoke English. I'm like, let's build something. So we started building this mound of rocks. I actually still have a picture of it. 
and we're engaging. I'm not telling him to calm down. I'm not telling him to stop and I'm not telling him how to behave. I'm playing with the poor kid because he was so bored. I would have been bored at five. And then we built it up. And I I said to him, I'm like, what do you want to do with this? What do you think he did? He destroyed it. He pulverized the thing that he built. And he had this big smile on his face. And then, of course, we were um, asked to go into the tour And we kept going and he was calm and his parents came over to me and he's like, wow, you're so good with kids. You must be a teacher. I'm like something like that. But again, is that their fault? Who knows? They just didn't know how to be with their kid. And chances are that's the way it always was in their home. They couldn't see him as this little tiny human animal that needed to play, right? They were forcing him to do something that just for many adults wouldn't even want to do that all day long. So The interesting thing is the tour went on and I actually tried to disengage with him because I wanted to enjoy the tour and it's not my responsibility to keep playing with him. But he even came up to Seth and said, hey, mister, mister, where's your girlfriend? Because he was looking for me because I was somewhere else. So he was seeking that connection from a stranger, right? So I, I share that because for those of us that never had that connection, As adults, in our own adult way, part of this healing is connecting to some of that curiosity. And you might find yourself wanting to play or wanting to be silly, or all of a sudden your speech goes off and you can't talk properly. This stuff happens as we start to rewire this stuff, right? You might have a desire to make chocolate chip cookies and you've never done that before, but it's because that never happened when you were a kiddo with your parents, right? So it doesn't mean that you're just going to eat chocolate chip cookies every day, but you want to feel these things that maybe never occurred. That is that healthy life force energy that I helped him tap into a tiny little bit. And trust me, I wanted to take him home, right? Because I knew the moment is that kind of thing typically doesn't change. So this is a long way of saying we inform parents, but they have to take the bait. And that's, something that we have to be okay with. Not every parent is going to want to understand this. And that also comes with a bit of a grief as well to us. Okay, um, next question. How do concussions interplay into the autonomic nervous system? So um, it's interesting you mentioned this this question. Tomorrow I'll be doing a talk with um, two of my alum and one of them, Amanda, had a very significant brain injury from a car accident years ago. And um, we're gonna talk about how working with me through my programs helped her. And she had worked with, she said 70 practitioners she worked with, and it was six months into doing Smart Body, Smart Mind that she was able to get out of her wheelchair. And that was because she was taking the survival stress out of her system from that car accident. And maybe even from And she said so, her life before that was filled with dysregulation. So having worked with people that have suffered from concussion and whiplash, what I've seen is typically, because people will say concussions can take forever to heal. That might be true if the brain injury is really bad. But from what I've seen, if it's a milder concussion, when we can work with the person's survival physiology and get them to grow their capacity and not focus so much on the concussion, it literally lets off the steam in the entire physiology. And then remember what I said about rest digest and that parasympathetic going into that gear, it then allows the system to heal and to repair the cells. And my hunch is with a lot of folks who have had big shock traumas, concussions, um, impact trauma, their system isn't healing quickly and or as quick as it could be because the rest of the system is still um, struggling with survival stress. So that's how those things play in. Question, why do tortured artists, musicians, writers, et cetera, seem to have so much creative energy and produce amazing con- con- creations? The more traumatized they are, it seems the more their work is revered as genius and profound. How can this be when so many of us are not able to do that? Isn't that a great question? So if you think of the artists and musicians and actors that we've known who have been prodigies, do they last very long? 
Uh -uh. I don't know about the art world, but I know in the musical world, um, there's a lot of folks that don't make it past into their earlier years, or sorry, later years. That creative energy is often being driven through survival. And um, Stephen King's a great example. If you read his memoir, he had some significant trauma growing up that was medical. Oh my God, it was horrible what happened to him when he was a kid. And it actually explains, someone mentioned night terrors. Night terrors can be connected to surgical trauma. Not always, but it's a connection. And so if you look at King and a lot of his books, they were very graphic and depicted a lot of horror and a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. I have a hunch that that's connected to that unresolved trauma from when he was a kiddo. Um, and he was also um, uh, alcoholic and he, he stopped the alcoholism and the, and he said, when that shifted, and even my husband who reads King, he said, when he stopped drinking, his, his writing wasn't as good because he wasn't just in that survival stress, creating these crazy scenes. Um, the interesting thing though, is when an artist or a musician or creator is regulated and really tuning into their soul, because again, I found, and my students have found when they become more regulated in their systems, they have a deeper connection to what we would call soul, spirit, bigger life force energy, the force, Star Wars, however you want to call it, that energy that's big. And then the, the art, the production is sustainable. It doesn't put a person into these wild swings where they're in many ways manic and then they crash, which is very common in that artistic world. So yes, a lot has been created through survival energy and it usually doesn't have a very long shelf life. Someone asked, in addition to the deep process of healing, are there things that can be done nightly before sleep to help actually get into the actual rest state before sleeping? Of course, you know, we talk about sleep hygiene, warm bath, herbal teas, light that's down, don't look at blue, not looking at blue light, which activates um, our system to think it's daytime. However, I do know that even people who do all these routines and aren't looking at their screen and they're being really calm, and some of you might be like this, you'll go to bed at night, you'll go to sleep and you're wide awake, even though you've done all these perfect things. I'm seeing some people nod their heads. So what does that mean? That means my handy cup, there's still a lot of survival stress in the system. Not that taking a warm bath and having a nice cup of tea can't be relaxing, but that's again, behavioral. So again, if this stored trauma, this stored survival stress is in the system, all the hygiene in the world won't make any difference. It will not. And so I would rather say to someone in your day, be mindful of your stress physiology. It's like that quote I said, awareness, being conscious of our survival responses in the day. If you're rushing, rushing, rushing during the day, and you're never stopping, you're building up all that survival stress on top of existing survival stress. So part of this work is learning how to have a very different lifestyle, slowing things down a bit. It doesn't mean that you can't be active and, and creative and doing lots, but to know that during the day, there needs to be this coming down so that we're not trapped up high in survival stress all the time. Do you have a more in-depth lecture on how to raise children to break the trauma cycle? Yes and no. So this is part of that. So, um, well, Bonnie and I, my assistant, we were just talking about this before we got on live today. And in many ways, um, the courses that I've created, the blog posts that I've created, the videos, while I'm not saying to you, this is how to raise children, it's teaching you how to be attuned to yourself. And here's the thing, when you're attuned to yourself, it is instinctually within us to know how to be with kids. That thing I did with that little kiddo, Levi, it wasn't because I read a book. It's, it, and I don't have my own biological children. 
it's because I'm attuning to his little system that is just freaking out. And I know mammals need play, especially when you're five years old. So raising children and breaking this trauma cycle, it starts with you, it starts with doing exactly what we're talking about. And of course, if you want to join the courses that I do, that, that will give you a very good head start. We have so many parents that have gone through this work and will say, I can't believe how things have changed. Um, I know how to listen to my kids and it's now easy to be with them. It's not hard. People will also say, um, I don't fight anymore with my partners or my ex because I know how to feel my physiology and be with it. And I'm not being activated and triggered when I'm around them. Okay. Is, is crying randomly a good sign for trauma release? Can crying too much cause more distress? It can. So it, I spoke about this yesterday a little bit, but um, as a quick, quick overview, emotions are important and crying is a very important emotion. And sometimes it can mask something else under. And often from my experience, it's masking anger or it's masking deep, deep shame. But typically it's anger, it's, a, it's an aggression. So if we don't have yet the capacity to full force roar and scream at the top of our lungs, I hate you, or I hate this, or get me out of here, or um, and it's too big for us at this moment, the tears are in many ways a reaction to not being able to express that life force energy. Does that make sense? So it's like a grief of something that we don't even know we don't even know that that's what it is, but it makes us sad. So too much crying where it's not causing a, a shift can definitely not be useful. We need it. We want it to feel restorative and the word would be nutritive. We want the tears to offer us a nutrition to our emotions, not make us sense more depression afterwards. So if tears are coming and it doesn't give us more energy, then that's a sign that there's something else under that. Mm -hmm. Next question. This actually connects beautifully with the topic of toxic shame. Is it normal to be resistant or even disgusted? That's the key word here. By connecting to the inner child, being talked to in a nurturing way. How can we work past that? 100%. So if we were never treated well, if we were really treated with that toxic shame and we were ridiculed and we weren't connected to and attuned to, and this is why I don't love the inner child work of talking to ourselves as if we're little ones, because it might be like, that's so not right. Cause that's not what I experience. It will feel um, disjointed. And so part again of building the capacity to be with our body is less about reparenting and inner child work. Again, um, I, I am a broken record often with this. It's about growing our capacity to be with little pieces of our sensation, little pieces of our body, and maybe connecting more to the environment than the internal, sparking up this ability to socially engage with the world around us first. And then the word we would use is titration, little drops little drops of connecting to our body and then maybe feeling that disgust. So this is another thing. Disgust is not a bad thing to sense. It's one of our basic primal human mammalian emotions, right? You smell something bad in the fridge. Ugh, that's not nice, right? It's in us as a reactive need. It's a protective need. And so the disgust that comes when we are connecting with our bodies is often a sign, believe it or not, that things are coming back online. If we've never really felt our body before, like really felt it and connected with it, it can give us a feeling of yuck because it's so foreign. And again, that happens because goes back to when we were little, we weren't touched in a connected good way. Maybe when we were changed, when our diapers were changed, our parents said, yuck, this is disgusting, right? This stinks so badly. And that face that they make and the energy of their hands trying to rush the, the diaper change, that gets into our system. So it also lets us know my body isn't good. 
it's gross. Even though you don't understand that as an infant, you're feeling that energetic from your parent or the babysitter, right? That was with you all the time, for example. So it's something that shifts. Trust me when I say the disgust is something that shifts, but we have to grow the capacity to actually feel that disgust and work with it. Next question. If one has an alcoholic and heavy smoker as a mom, so if there's an alcoholic heavy smoker of a mother, mother, why is it that one child will grow up and have MS while the other siblings do not? So it's an interesting question, right? It can, it can be a few things. So I am gonna make an assumption. Maybe these siblings are still alive and maybe they haven't yet expressed the survival physiology. That could be one thing. The other thing I've seen this in siblings who were brought up in abusive households. If a sibling for whatever reason is a little bit more able to assert themselves is a bit more of a nuisance, is a bit more of the bad kid, is the teenager that is reckless and listens to hard head banging music and does the drugs and gets all that stuff out of them, obviously within safety reasons, reasoning, they might in their own way have dealt with some of the survival stress that was stored from when they were little. Often, and this connects what Gabor Mate has really found in his research and in his book, When the Body Says No, those that end up and have these um, neurodegenerative conditions like MS, ALS, they were the good kid. They were the one that, that cleaned the house so that mom wouldn't have to work. They were the ones that never showed any emotional distress because they were the one that had it all together. And, you know, sibling over there is the crazy one because they're being a nuisance and they're talking back. And that's not good. So I'm going to be good. And I've worked with people like this who were the good kid. And then their pain and their troubles in their 20s is just off the charts. And they're like, how come my siblings are fine? I said, well, and then I'll ask them the question and it lines up with this, this. So sometimes it can be that the kids that were a bit more belligerent, actually, it was a protective response, believe it or not, to get that stuff out. And then the good, the good girl, the good boy are the ones that are holding all that emotion in. How is resistance dealt with in smart body, smart mind? I find this to be a big impediment that can be difficult to get by. You just accept that it's going to happen. There's even a pregame video that um, is part of the pre-program learning that is all about resistance. And the interesting thing with resistance is again, we name at the top of the course, you might be terrified through some of this. I don't expect you to go in with cheery, like this is gonna be great. We're working with old stuff that is very, very hard and very, very um, activating and might be of the abusive nature. And we've been storing it for some of us 60, 70 years. That's a lot. So I say in, 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 um, humor in some ways, but also in all honesty, expect to be a little on edge, expect to be like, I don't know if I want to go do that today, but then just a little pushing can be okay. A little bit of a, okay, let's just try five minutes. Um, and then sometimes the resistance is a sign of healthy aggression coming up. And often I'll say, where is that in your body? You know, our moderators will help you find like, maybe that resistance is healthy aggression. Maybe it's a boundary that has nothing to do with the course, but is part of your system finally asserting itself, but in the wrong way or in the wrong time, right? So it'll happen and it's part of the process. And then the key is how can we continue? How can we continue to come back to the basics? When you're feeling that resistance, are you connected with your body? And nine times out of 10, a person will be in their old patterns that wants to keep them quote unquote safe, but it's actually not safe. So again, humans like, um, they like to know what's going to happen. We like predictability. And so this is a huge shift. If we've been predictable in how our symptoms are, 
and you're here thinking, oh, wow, there's all these people that have shown that they've shifted out of these symptoms and conditions, there will be a part of us that might be saying, I can't do that, right? And that's a part of resistance. That's a part of your system wanting to stay in that old pattern of dysregulation. And so breaking out of it, it's something that you work with constantly, continually. Someone asks, any suggestions on getting your significant other on the same page? As you know, how far, uh, as you, as far as, as how to raise your child when he is very much about being tough and not crying. So I'll rephrase that again. How do you get your significant other, your partner, your spouse to get on the same page when you're raising a child and you have two very different um, ideologies? you have to work on it. It might be couples counseling. It might be putting your foot down. I hate to say this, but there might need to be an ultimatum because when you know this information, it's going to be very tough to see your little ones being treated in a tough way. That's rough because you now know differently. And that is something that you have to feel into and figure out with your partner and if they cannot come on board, then you have to make some hard decisions because having two parental styles is very, very tricky. It's very confusing for the little person. It's also why uh, I'm not a big lover of when parents split and there's dual custody and one week a kid has a totally specific type of interaction and then the next week they have to change and be a different kind of kid. That is very stressful on a little person's nervous system. And I also know that that's how our systems are worked with the courts and all that. And it, it's, it can be an absolute mess. So I'm just going to be really honest there. You have to do some soul, soul, soul uh, work to be like, is this going to work in the long run, especially if your kids are really little? What if you had a traumatic birth? Is that also the parent's fault? You know, no. And the thing is, is, fault versus something went wrong. You know, I could sit here and we could figure out ways how that was maybe the fault of the mother, but it's not, right? That seems a little harsh, but if she has not worked with her trauma and her system is tight and closed and shut down, then it's going to be tough to get that baby out. It's going to be tough to have that natural flow. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's big stuff, but Again, a lot of what we're seeing with the difficulties of birth, at least in Western world, a lot of it is connected to the lack of connection that um, women have with their bodies and allowing their bodies to emit expression and emotion and follow their impulse for when they are birthing and advocating for themselves. So we don't need to say that it's their fault, but we also want to say, and what can we do after that traumatic birth to help the baby find more regulation? What can we do to help the mother, the father, or whomever is there work on the shock of that traumatic birth? I have worked with women who went into complete terror and shutdown during emergency C-sections. And I, I came to like the house and the baby was blue because the baby wasn't connecting with the mother and it wouldn't feed. And it wasn't the baby that I had to work with. It was actually the mom I had to work with because she was still in terror from this experience. And what was holding in her body was the shame of I needed a C-section and my doula screwed up and all these sorts of things. And we got to get her, I had to get her anger out. And honest to God, it was so interesting as I worked with the mother and I was holding the baby, the, the baby started to get color back into its, into its skin. And that night she finally latched. So again, it's, it's not so much fault. It's like, okay, what is going on with the systems of physiology? We need to get this person out of survival stress because you are not going to be able to connect very well with that infant. If you are still in survival stress, this is a reason for so much postpartum depression in mothers. We actually just got a beautiful story from someone about this, which we hope to share soon um, around this. And um, so, yeah. I don't like the word fault, but it could be something didn't go as it should. 
And we need to fix that. We need to fix the, the hurt, the harm. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up soon. Um, let's see here. How is PMS and cramps, so menstrual related pieces related to the nervous system? So there's two sides to this. There's definitely a side of nervous system dysregulation, as I talked about when I read that passage of the book, um, high level of sympathetic, high level of freeze that impacts the viscera, that impacts the flow of, of exchange of nutrients within the vasculature, going to the uterine wall, going to that entire reproductive area. So if there is this harsh fight, flight, and freeze, it is going to impact that area just as it might impact our bladder, our digestion, et cetera. So I have heard and know of folks who have regulated their systems and that has shifted. I also know as I learn more about this self as I approach 50, um, that things change in the female area and hormones change and you might need to shift things a little bit, dietary, hormonally, and I also believe that sometimes a little extra help from the alternative and even sometimes medical world might be important. I did two wonderful interviews with a specialist in hormones. Her name is Kitty. If you just go to my site, Irene and Kitty, and they'll come up, K-I-T-T-Y, short for Catalina. She's an expert with the female reproductive system and hormones um, because sometimes it is trauma for sure especially if you know that you've also got migraine headaches with this, your digestion goes off, you've got fatigue. Um, but then sometimes someone will get all that stuff lined up and there'll still be um, troubles. So I think multidimensional approach is really important. Will SPSM help with the process of creating a sense of self and a sense of identity? 100%. This is a great question for me to end on. So when we have not been given the chance as little ones to express ourselves, think back to that little kiddo in Rome, right? We're having a life that is just riddled with, I want to kill my parents and I want to be a nuisance, but then I have to shut down because if I don't shut down, I'm going to keep getting hit because I can't express myself. That messes with our ability to create our own identity, who we are what we like, what we don't like. And so one of the key hallmarks that our folks will say when they move through, say, smart body, smart mind, and they relearn how to be with their body, and this is important, it's not just being with the body in the felt sense, that's important too, but with the environment, with their movement, because kiddos also, especially infants, they need to move and play. And many of us were put in devices. We were put in walkers and cribs and jolly jumpers. We were fastened to things that weren't mama, where there's movement and rhythm and, and connection. So movement is also important, relearning how to use your body. So all these things connect to restoring health to, to your, not just nervous system, but also to the soul also to your connection to this is me. And it can be a little disorienting when we first land on me for the first time. And for some people, it can be downright terrifying because it's never been felt. But again, we prime you for that. We prepare you for that through these very slow, um, intentional, attentive, I call them neurosensory lessons that teach you how to come back into your body through those methodologies that I mentioned at the top of the hour or almost two hours ago now. Um, so quick notes. So yes, a hundred percent. And you know, this might sound all too good to be true. How can this one thing help with autoimmune and anxieties and depression and getting anger out and parenting and creating a sense of self and releasing traumas from birth, it does seem like a far stretch. And what we're doing is we're coming back to that baseline biology, that nervous system capacity, that regulation, 
we've lived as a society of humans, not knowing what that looks like ever for most of us. And when we get these foundations on board, the system, it's like it just drops and goes, holy cow, this is what it means to feel human. This is what it means like to feel my body moving. This is what it feels like to actually smell the, the sky, the clouds. This is what it feels like to be in a in a warm shower and actually feel my body. This is what it feels like to feed myself and feel the food. This is what it's like to feel safe in my own skin. And it's a process. It's not a quick fix. So I'll be very clear. The, the work is not to be done like it's a quick fix and a technique. I liken SBSM more with a semester of university, right? Usually they're three months you learn something, you're not just learning education. If you think of science, you're going to the lab, you're experimenting, you're talking with your peers, you're asking for help. So within the program, um, quick notes, it's experience-based, it's education-based, and there's professional support through the time that we're together live in the course. Um, my colleagues, there's about 10 of them. They're all trained in somatic experiencing. Most of them are trained all in the work of Kathy Kane, the early trauma work. And many of them are trained in some form of somatic movement um, practice like Feldenkrais, yoga, et cetera. And these people that are helping me answer and be with you, they had done Smart Body, Smart Mind first. So many of them, I didn't know them until they went through the program and they realized how pivotal it was to not only their own healing, but understanding the work better. And so there's also that kind of support within. Um, something that people often ask, um, how do you interact with me live? I do training calls every week, um, nine out of the 10 weeks of in-person or online learning like this on Zoom. I'm teaching, um, experiential teaching, handouts, all those sorts of things, but everything is recorded. Right, so we have people on the other side of the world who are sleeping right now, and they just do the recordings after the fact. Um, there's also Q and A calls with my husband Seth. Um, he and I will be doing a special lecture on Saturday, all on the ill effects of dysregulated um, parenting. So he is also a colleague of mine. He's brilliant. He gets this stuff. He and I had very different upbringings. His was abusive and traumatic. Mine not so much. Um, so his experience is wonderful and adds that element of having been there, done that. When I met Seth, um, that's my husband, he was living in complete complex PTSD, social anxiety, addictions, all of it. And he shifted that quite substantially. Um, so we'll talk about his story on Saturday. Yeah, training calls are 90 minutes long. The Q&A calls are 60 minutes long. Everything is recorded and the course is yours for life. So when you become an SBSM member, you are an alumni, and when we run the course, again, you get to come back, participate, ask questions, get support. It isn't just when you're in the live session for the first time. So it is something that you gain access to. If I add a module, if I add more trainings, it's all still part of your initial tuition. So there are many people that have been in this world with me. Like I said, David, one of my first alum or first uh, members, He's been doing this work for seven years. He doesn't do it in the way that he would have done it back five, six years ago, but it's now part of his life in a very different way. So to end, um, thank you everyone for being here. Lots of talking. I hope I got to um, questions that helped everyone uh, learn a bit more about themselves, about others around them. We'll see you later and really listen and follow your impulses see how you can connect with these things I've been talking about today and just notice what you notice. All right, everyone. Bye. <music>